of all the bustling places in this awakening nation, none is as busy as a Cantonese kitchen just before noon. Food-crazy Guangzhou is a booming city of 10 million people and 10,000 restaurants. Wizard of the Walk, Johnson Wong, makes sure his 40 chefs stay on the cutting edge of the city's exotic cuisine. This southern metropolis is the home of China's most famous export. Cantonese food, although some of it might be a tough sell on the international market. Anything that flies in the sky or walks on the ground, as long as its back is facing the sky, you can eat it. We attach great importance to the freshness of food. Cantonese people love to eat. Translation, they eat practically anything. And the closer it is to being alive, the better goose web, fish lips, all manner of bugs. Wong is kept busy dreaming up dishes for his affluent and demanding patrons. I'll try anything, like stuffing insects into bean sprouts, bees, bee pupas. If you don't eat them, they will fly away. And when he's not running his restaurants, he's walking on his weekly television show. Okay, ready. For Wong, food is entertainment, literally. Okay, okay, okay. A TV series, radio call-in shows, newspaper columns, food seminars have made Wong the ultimate celebrity cook. <laughs> Wong's grandfather was a kung fu master. His mother sang Chinese opera. And his show is part Jackie Chan. Part Tom Jones, part Julia Child. It's all gobbled up by the newly prosperous Chinese, those who have more food than they know what to do with. People are looking for new taste sensations. We no longer see food as something to appease hunger. Appeasing hunger is an old story. On the other side of China, appeasing hunger is not an old story. Mrs. Gao was only 15 when she came to this tiny village to marry a man she had never met. Their lives have been unending hardship, with barely enough to eat and even less water. People living in towns or cities can have a bath. No facility. No bath here. <laughs> the Gao's live far away from the prosperous coastal regions, in China's northwest, high in the parched and barren hills of the Los Plateau. Spectacular, forbidding, the Los Plateau was once a vast and verdant forest. But over the centuries, demand for lumber and cropland stripped the hills of their trees. Now the fertile soil and the farmers who depend upon it for survival are at the mercy of the sun and wind. As drought and development claim precious farmland, China may be losing its ability to feed itself. At the Gao's village, the fields of corn and beans that cling to the hillsides hardly produce enough to keep them alive. Unless it rains soon, they will produce nothing. 
The sun is so hot that the crops all dry up and die. But if it rains, the soil turns soft and the plants grow well. It all depends on the rain here. Inside their traditional cave dwelling, Mrs. Gao prepares dinner. Here, deciding what to have is not a problem. Dinner is noodles every night. One out of eight Chinese still lives in absolute poverty. Just getting enough to eat is a daily struggle. The day before yesterday, we had more than enough to eat. As for the most delicious food, it's noodles with meat. For people like us, that's as good as it gets. Even in what some are calling the Chinese century, many people's biggest fear is still the fear of hunger. A Chinese legend tells of the artist who painted a cookie. When he was finished, he wasn't hungry anymore. It's Li Jin's favorite story. The passion for food has shaped China's culture its history, its soul. It's a passion born of deprivation. Being short of food gives you a special awareness of it, the look of it, the smell of it, the pleasure of preparing a meal, the sounds, the aroma of cooking, the anticipation of eating, the pleasure of tasting. Hunger feeds the imagination about food. For Li Jin, food is a source of creativity, and inspiration as a painter and as a cook. You know, carp represents the Chinese ideal of beauty in a fish. It has the typical beautiful shape, full and round. He believes China's magnificent cuisine is a cultural treasure that must be preserved and celebrated. For Chinese people, fish is associated with lucky things, a prosperous life, abundance. I love fish. Food has always been central to the life and character of China. So too has the problem of too many mouths and too little land. People were short of food for long periods in our history because we have such a large population. So food has always been a way to measure wealth in China. Only the rich had good food to eat. <laughs> These artists are part of the China that no longer has to eat to live, but rather lives to eat. <laughs> <笑>还那么绿绿的 
，但是不像过去谁一见谁都说吃了吗？对，现在那话没有。现在叫吃了吗？<笑>对对，现在是吃了吗？自己要上去打六十分吧。But prosperity has not brought good news for everyone in China, and it will bring unwelcome news for Li Jin. For generations, fish brought good fortune to the people of the Guo River. But now their fish nets sit empty, their houseboats lie rotting, the water they live on poisoned and polluted by industrial waste. For years, they've been fighting in vain to get compensation. Now, they're waiting for their last hope, a crusading lawyer from Beijing. The spectacular economic boom that has created riches for so many has ravaged much of the countryside. Lawyers Wang Sanfa and Zhang Jingjing fight for the farmers and fishermen whose crops and catch are being destroyed. 对，那个身份证呢要给这个，你要要不然到时候说你说养殖呢，按照渔业法呢，养要有养殖资格证的，你没有，那你这种养殖是非法的，我也不赔。这是打渔业官司，经常碰到这样的事。They're headed south to Anhui Province, even in a country where over 60 percent of the rivers and lakes are heavily polluted. Anhui has achieved environmental infamy. The lethal discharges of its factories have killed crops, animals, even people. As the train arrives in the ancient city of Bojo, Wang Senfa knows there are risks to their mission. More often than not, local authorities side with the polluters and do not appreciate his interfering. But to the poor and powerless in China's countryside, this tiny man is a folk hero. Gong Huailing hoped for a good life when she married one of the Guo fishermen. Hope is turned to hopelessness. Ho Shueda farmed fish all his life. Then adversity turned him into a fighter. He tells Wang the fishermen believe a leather tanning factory upstream is illegally releasing highly toxic waste, but the local government is protecting him. Surprisingly, this man would agree. Pan Yue is at the center of power in Beijing, but he talks like no other member of China's government. Most officials got their high positions through pushing growth. So it's very difficult to get them to change their approach. 
China's vice minister of the environment is as outspoken as he is exasperated that on his watch, China is becoming the world's biggest polluter. Let them choose the environment or a Mercedes-Benz car. They choose the Mercedes, for sure. They want to be rich first. The environment is their second choice. Growth is what China has been all about for the last 20 years. But it comes with a cost. China must feed over 20% of the world's population with only 7% of the world's arable land. And that land is disappearing fast paved over by progress. Now, progress is moving west. In mountainous Sichuan province, arable land is concentrated in the large basin around its capital city and latest boomtown, Chengdu. This export processing zone is one of scores of industrial parks springing up like mushrooms on the flat and fertile plain. But unlike mushrooms, you can't eat what's produced here. Computer chips made by multinational giant Intel. It's Sophie Fan's pride and joy. She returned to China from Canada two years ago to help sell her hometown to foreign investors. Chengdu, international hotspot. The better Sophie does her job, the more land will be lost. Her pitch is simple and successful. I will convince you that your business will make money. It is the first thing I will tell you. Over the last 10 years, development has swallowed up 10% of China's arable land. I personally feel losing land to factories is a sacrifice. If the benefits of development to the public are greater, I think people will understand that sacrifice is necessary. Our life is better than before. We have to sacrifice when we make progress. In the bustling restaurants of Chengdu, deals are done and development is celebrated. Sophie and her team are there to enjoy Sichuan opera and the local specialty, hot pot. The fiery dish of duck broth and animal parts was originally a simple meal for the poor. Now, a feast for the winners in China's development boom. What can I do? What can I do? To stay alive, you must eat. Zhen Tianzhen is one of the losers. One of 66 million peasants forced off their land by development. His peach orchards were gobbled up by one of Chengdu's new industrial zones. But he's come back to his old neighborhood, squatting in an abandoned farmhouse and surrounded by factories. Even a stay in jail didn't deter him. They forced me into the car. They took me to the police branch office. They detained me for 12 days there. It's unfair. I'm an old man. I don't lie. And I'm also an idiot if I just wait for the government to be fair. He knows it's only a matter of time before the bulldozers and the police are back. This whole development thing is only for the government. It has nothing to do with us, the regular citizens, nothing. It even makes us poorer. The government gets richer while the citizens get poorer. I am telling you the truth. Now, all over China, protests and even violence 
against land seizures and pollution erupt almost daily. Under China's rise, the losers eat bitter, while the winners eat well. It may look like France, but this chateau is just outside Beijing. Just a few years ago, this was peasant wheat fields. Today, it's a replica of the Chateau Lafitte near Paris, along with the gardens of Versailles. A hint of Fontainebleau, with some Roman pillars for good measure. A symbol of what's possible in China today. If you have the money and the appetite, old Europe is big in new China. This is where the country's winners celebrate their success and their weddings. The food is exquisite. The dishes' names resound with the glory of wealth and good luck. The golden ox brings the good news. The dragon rises from the sea. Auspicious names are preferred because in China, you are what you eat. To Raymond and to his lovely bride. Cheers. All the best for software engineer Raymond and Vivian, the programmer. This is not exactly the hard life either. And Li Long is not just another kid enjoying a happy meal. He's one of China's little emperors, only children who rule the families of China's new middle class. And he is the son of Li Jin, the artist whose greatest passion is food, has succumbed to the cravings of a six-year-old with a passion for burgers. And love it they do. With less time to eat and more money to spend, urban Chinese make an easy target for Western fast food, even if that means more obesity, more heart disease, and more diabetes. At least Li Jin has managed to limit his son's indulgence to one visit a month. <laughs> <laughs> Li Jin fears China is losing its soul as food loses its meaning. It is a fact. Food is becoming identical. Distinguishing features are fewer and fewer. We should not separate food from a country's culture and history. That's my opinion. If culture is to have any meaning, we must experience it through real things, like food. And here, food has special meaning. The Chinese believe it has the power to cure. A trip to the world's biggest market for herbal medicine is a revelation of Chinese culture. For pollution-fighting lawyer Wang Sanfa, it's a reminder of why he helps societies weak and powerless. The visit to the market in Bojo unexpectedly becomes a journey into his past. If it grows, blooms, or crawls, it's here. The thousands of dealers would never let you doubt for a second that centipedes can beat a bad rash, or that dried human placenta can stop a headache.
，这是那个，在我们那儿叫朵罗号。Wang knows some of the exotic merchandise here only too well. He grew up as one of five children in a poor peasant family. There was never enough to eat. Thank you. 那那么黑，哎，当时山东那个地方很穷，嗯，所以我就基本上是吃那个长长大的，嗯，很苦。Relief from the bitter struggle against hunger has been a constant dream for China's peasants. For centuries, they've beseeched the powerful river dragon to bring abundance and prosperity. But Li Jiafu and his parents are just here to enjoy the races. They no longer need to pray for a better life. They're part of the largest mass migration in human history. More than a hundred million peasants who've abandoned the land for jobs and opportunities in China's cities. The Li family used to call the Milua Valley home. Life here may seem unchanging, but most of the adults have gone. The villagers who remain are either too young or too old to leave. When the Lees make a rare visit to their family home, Jafu's father declares he's proud that he and his children no longer farm. For sure I am proud of it. Working with physical strength, the blue-collar work, is not as good as working with knowledge, white-collar work. As a farmer's son with a university degree in computer programming, Jifu is living his father's dream. But here, Jifu spends his time as he did as a child, in the kitchen, helping his grandfather. Computers are not where Jafu's heart is. There is a saying in China, food is heaven. Eating is the most important thing in our life. We say this at the dining table, no matter what kind of emergency happens, eat first, deal with it later. Cooking is in Jafu's blood. His grandfather became the village chef by helping his neighbors cook what little they had during times of hunger. Risking his father's disapproval, Jifu has decided to follow in his grandfather's footsteps. He will become a chef. For him, preparing food is a link to the land and the village he's left behind. I still miss the old life. When I go back home to visit my grandparents, we celebrate the festivals together. Those times are warm and joyful. I miss those joyful times. It's hard to find this closeness in the city. People there are cold and detached. I worked a lot on Jafu to get him to give up being a cook. 
but he told me nothing is more important than food. Finally, I said, if that's your decision, then try your best and do it well. Maybe it is what he was born to do. Jafu will need more than inborn talent to succeed in a place that takes its cuisine as seriously as China does. He'll have to struggle. On the Guo River, Wang the lawyer is in pursuit of the polluters. Born in the year of the dog, he has the inborn tenacity of a terrier. He needs it. He and Miss Zhang have traveled to the village closest to the leather tanning factory. The two lawyers must prove that pollution from the factory is killing the fish. Zhang is videotaping evidence to be used in court. A few years ago, the farmers could swim in this river. Not anymore. Wong wants to get the silt tested for chrome and cadmium, two toxic heavy metals used in tanning leather. <laughs> But Wang and Zhang need hard proof. For that, they must get closer to the factory. Far to the south, in Guangzhou's fish market, singing chef Johnson Wong is tracking an elusive quarry as well. Something special, something wild and live. But there's a downside to the economic prosperity that's made him so successful, one he's about to discover. Pollution is taking its toll on Canton's most sought-after delicacies. River fish are very popular, but as pollution is increasing and water quality gets worse and worse, many fish are becoming inedible or even extinct. China is already the world's largest producer of fish and seafood. But the surging economy means China's enormous appetite for fish and the money to pay for it is growing even faster. This is creating a serious problem. Now demand for fish is exceeding supply. And so the quality of the fish is getting worse and worse. China is discovering the limits of its natural resources. And Johnson, he may have met his match in that feisty big garupa. In this place of plenty, it's hard to believe that China has any problem growing enough food. If food is heaven, the Guangzhou wholesale vegetable market is heaven's gate. Food from all over China is meticulously cut, peeled, and readied for sale. The volume is overwhelming. 
the variety stunning. But here again, prosperity threatens China's ability to feed itself. The city of Guangzhou lies at the head of the sprawling Pearl River Delta in southern China. It was here on this massive floodplain that China's economic miracle began. The Delta is one of the most fertile places in the world. Now it is also one of the most industrialized. Sandwiched between the factories and highways are the remnants of its agricultural past. Tiny market gardens that must feed the appetites of the huge industrial cities of the Delta. Here, as everywhere in China, more and more food must be wrung out of less and less land. The intense production is fueled by chemicals, staggering amounts of pesticides and fertilizers, at least twice the amount the West uses to grow its food. On top of that, there are heavy metals in the air, in the soil, and in the water. Fields are often irrigated with the untreated wastewater of thousands of factories. These vegetables will end up in the markets and walks of China, along with their chemicals and contaminants. Tasty as they may look, many of China's crops are not edible by Western food safety standards. It's a long way from heaven, according to the Chinese government's environment chief, Pan Yue. China's economic growth looks like magic from the outside, but it can't go on. It's creating huge problems. These problems are leading us to disaster. Pan Yue doesn't flinch from the truth, even though his government isn't always happy to hear it and has demoted him in the past. Sometimes I feel alone. I paid for what I did. I'm prepared to pay more in the future. I don't represent the mainstream of the government. Still, I have hope. Pan Yue believes neither he nor his country has a choice. If we can't solve the problems, then all of us will be finished. We can't import water. We can't import air. We live under the same sky. We are all Chinese. I cannot survive if a fisherman dies. As China's growth continues, it seems almost impossible that disaster can be averted. Yet China's history is the story of impossibility surmounted. The southern Los Plateau is where Chinese history began 5,000 years ago. Now China's agricultural future is beginning again on these terraces. Market economics has come to fields where for centuries peasants harvested only wheat and sorrow. This is the face of China's future. Dr. Xu Wenbin doesn't know anything about farming, but he doesn't see that as a drawback. China is changing. Its farmers are changing too. The head of the local hospital in the city of Luochuan took his life savings and bought 3,000 apple trees. They've made him rich. The only thing you have to worry about is taking good care of the apple trees. There is no worry about making money. <laughs> that rustling is the sound of China taking over the world market for apples. It's taken them only a few years and an awful lot of bags. In early summer, thousands of workers put every single fruit in a paper wrapper that protects it from disease and pollution and helps meet international standards. Apples can generate 10 times the income wheat does. So instead of growing so much wheat, China is buying it abroad and exporting high-priced fruits and vegetables. If Dr. Xu has his way, his apples will be coming soon to supermarkets around the world.
You can also glimpse the future at this small provincial cooking school. These young men are the carriers of the flame of China's great cuisine, if they pass today's test. Among them is Li Jiafu, the young man who left computer programming for cooking. Today, he may regret that. They've got one hour to prepare four dishes. Juhua fish is a feat of cutting, breading, and frying. Done properly, it blossoms like a chrysanthemum when dropped into the hot oil. Cooking in his grandfather's kitchen was never like this. The finished dishes are run across campus to the waiting judges. He hasn't done as well as he would have liked, but Jafu is undaunted. His love for China's food undiminished. I am happiest when I'm creating wonderful meals for others. I think about how much joy my food will give them. This is what will make me happy. Lawyers Wang and Zhang intend to be part of China's future too, as crusaders nipping at the heels of runaway growth. When they finally reach the tanning factory, they find piles of toxic leather waste. They also find what they've been searching for. But there's a problem. It gets worse. There seems to be as much pollution above the factory as below. Wang realizes that may let the factory off the hook. The Guo fisherman's long wait is not yet over. But Wang will not give up easily. He's won almost half of his 70 cases. He believes that too many factories polluting too much may be China's present, but not its future. He intends to save China's countryside one case at a time. This is not an easy case. We have lost cases because we couldn't collect enough evidence or because the local government interfered. China has only recently created the rule of law. It is a new concept for everyone, and authorities do not always accept that it applies to them. Rome was not built in a day. It takes time. In the water-starved Northwest, the battle for China's food supply is being fought one brick at a time. The laying of the last building stone in a new village on the Los Plateau is heralded by firecrackers. And traditional Shanxi dancers. Forty families are being moved from their remote village to a place closer to water. And in a region where riches are measured by access to water, these poor villagers have just become wealthy. But only a few have been relocated. Others are not so lucky. High on the Los Plateau, in the intense heat of summer, Mr. Gao 
is moving mountains. These giant terraces are part of a government campaign to reclaim agricultural land and stop the precious soil from being washed away by the rain when it comes. His wife begins a daily ordeal, the trip down a massive gorge in search of water. My arms ache, my body aches. Sometimes I don't think I can make it. This tiny stream is the only source of water for the entire village. Mrs. Gao makes the two-hour journey twice a day, every day. I have no choice. I have to get the water. If I don't make the trip, then we have nothing to drink. But the water is yellow with sand and sediment. Before they can drink it, they must let it sit for hours. And sometimes Mrs. Gao makes the arduous trip only to discover that the stream has temporarily gone dry. Look at the place where we live. It is not good. If only we could live in a better place. If only we could have a better life. This is my wish, but it will never come true. China faces another threat to its arable land. One even the Great Wall is powerless to resist. Northern China is drying up. Increased demand for water is draining even underground supplies. Land is turning to sand. Once this was cropland, then the sand came. Many fled, abandoning their homes and farms. The top of the sand hill was even taller than the roof of our house. Sometimes the sand totally buried the crops. If the sand was not too deep, we would dig them out. We had to plant three, four times every year and still didn't get any good crops. I decided to find a way to stop the sand moving. I struggled with the sand. I wanted to win. Niu Wei Ching's neighbors laughed when she started to plant trees. And more trees. Twenty years later, she and her family have planted millions of trees in the desert. I will create green land till I die. As long as I can get up and move, I will keep on planting. I will spend my whole life in the desert planting trees and beating back the sand. I hope to turn the desert into an oasis, a place with birds and flowers. The desert will disappear. Today, nobody laughs at Mrs. New. Her tree campaign has made her a national hero of the government's reforestation program, a symbol for a government that believes in the power of great mass campaigns, model citizens, and people who triumph over the elements. As the local school children hail their hero with a song of devotion, somewhere in China, another field is lost to drought or to development. China may well become a 21st century superpower, but a question hovers over its future. Can the ancient, indomitable will of the Chinese people save the heaven that is food?